Today's show is brought to you by Work Life with Adam Grant, a podcast from TED. Our work lives and our world have changed dramatically in recent weeks. If you're looking to explore the science of making work not suck in these trying times, you should check out Work Life with Adam Grant. This season, you'll learn how to procrastinate less with Margaret Atwood and how small wins can help you fight burnout. New episodes come out on Tuesdays. Listen to Work Life with Adam Grant wherever you get your podcasts. I know I'll be listening. And now, from the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. So on the second Monday in March, I went to the launch for Glennon Doyle's new book, Untamed. It was this magical night. We were inside this church in Brooklyn Heights. It was packed. Glennon had written about falling in love with her wife, the soccer player Abby Wambach. She's been on the show, actually. Anyhow, that night, she was sitting in the first row, and there were people up in the bleachers everywhere, and as Glennon walked into center stage, they erupted in applause. It was meant to be the first event in Glennon's national book tour. And I remember the date exactly, March 9th, because it was the last time in 2020 that I would gather in real life in a room full of people, anywhere. Two days later, Glennon canceled the tour. There are so many people like Glennon. People who are scheduled to have their big debut, their TED Talk, their opening night, their album release. And at Hello Monday, it's got us thinking, where does this year's art go? So this is the first of a two-part series. And we'll throw in a couple of bonus episodes as well. I talked to a bunch of creative people about how they're getting by, what happens to all that work, and what's changing for them now in the midst of this pandemic. To start, I called Glennon to ask her about canceling her tour. Everything feels like a vortex now, so I don't know. But um, this would have been early on. We didn't know. We were on the road, and people were still saying, like, is it dangerous to be out? Like, should we be out? Should we be gathering? Um, there had been no shelter in places, n- none of this yet. And I just, I was sitting in a hotel room. I guess it was the night after I saw you all, because I was in one more place. I was in Nashville. And... Um, We got off the stage in Nashville and every day, you know, people were bringing me more information about what could come down the road. Everyone was doing the best they could to gather information. And the general thought of our team was, okay, we'll do like two or three more and then we'll go home. And Abby and I were actually in our room and I was sitting in bed and I kept saying to her, I mean, I was just in a pity party, man. I have these two selves right? So I have a self that is a leader and knows what to do and is putting other people's needs ahead of my own and sees clearly. And then there is a full nother, a whole nother self that is like, I am heartbroken over my thing and why is so unfair. And and I was in that place. All right. That's the self I usually say for my wife. (laughs) Right. And I remember saying the words to her, I cannot believe this is happening. Untamed is the most important, beautiful thing I have ever made in my creative life. And now this. And something about hearing those words come out of my mouth made me realize, oh, that's not true at all. The most beautiful, important work I've ever made is this community of people that I am now possibly putting at risk by asking them to come here about this other thing that I made, right? So even though it was kind of an early call to cancel it all at that point, it was clear. I've just had all of these times in my career. This, it happened to me last time. Like when I was launching Love Warrior, I had to announce my divorce two weeks before the launching of that book, which was a, a, an epic marriage redemption story. I, re- right? I remember that. Like, My agents and publishers are like, just stop publishing things. Just stop because everything falls apart. So, um, so, so it was similar only in that it was a hard decision to make, but also very simple once we got it down to the root of the things, which is what's more important, the book or the community. In the moment, that must have been a really hard decision to make. I think a lot of us are walking this um, two selves right? Like the self that can see how much harder some other people have it and can worry about the world and can think about how much we have to be grateful for. 
in terms of what some other people are experiencing. And then there are the selves that is are just heartbroken over projects that we thought we would launch, over weddings that we thought we'd have, uh, graduations. I mean, my friends have their little babies that they've raised since they were little and all their graduation things are canceled. Like, I think it's an important time to honor the and both of that, that it is okay for us to be heartbroken over our things while also maintaining this consciousness that things are hard out there. I love the way you say that, Glennon, because I've been thinking so much and talking to my own friends over the last couple of weeks, just about how sad people are. And we don't want to talk about that part. We want to race to the doing and there's a lot of doing to be done. But it's also really important to just sit for a moment with the fact that this is really sad for a lot of people. And it's hard to hold that. It's so sad. And I think there's a double thing going on. So I think we're, we're really sad because of what's going on out in the world. And I think we're also really sad because many of us, most of us kind of use activity and busyness as a distraction. And now we're all, it's like we're snow globes, you know, we just keep ourselves shaken up. But now we have this like collective forced settling. It reminds me very much of early recovery when I was getting sober. It's just like all your distractions are gone and you're left with the thing you were trying to distract yourself from in the first place, which is like your own self and your own humanity and and the truth of life, which is that we are always very vulnerable, right? That we have control over nothing, that in the end of the day, all we really have is ourselves and our people. So I just think it's a double thing. I think we're we're scared and 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 sad because of the world, but I think we're also sort of in this detox, like forced detox of distraction. And that's leaving us with all of what Pema Shadron would call our hot loneliness. Right. Right. I love that you said that, Glennon, because no joke, the passage that I highlighted that I wanted to talk about with you from this book, if it's okay, I'll just read it. Yeah. Yeah. And this is from your new book, Untamed. We're like snow globes. We spend all of our time, energy, words, and money creating a flurry, trying not to know making sure that the snow doesn't settle so we never have to face the the fiery truth inside us, solid and unmoving. The relationship is over. The wine is winning. The pills aren't for back pain anymore. He's never coming back. That book won't write itself. The move is the only way. Quitting this job will save my life. It is abuse. You never grieved him. It's been six months since we made love. Spending a lifetime hating her is no life at all. We keep ourselves shaken up because there are dragons in our center. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. That's so <laughs> wild that you chose that one. What on earth? I know. But it just, <laughs> that's the moment that we're in, right? It's the great settling. And I, for myself, I have to think that after the settling comes the remembering that there's some deep remembering of my humanity and my connection to my family it sounds sort of beautiful when I say it like that, but right now it's just frustrating. They're getting on my nerves. They're in the other room. I'm currently in the bedroom mm-hmm. closet so that I could have space from them. Mm-hmm. But there is a thing that comes after that. First the pain, and then there's some waiting and frustration, and then there's this rising. Yeah. I think that it, if what's in the center of that snow globe is our humanity, then that's a really good thing for us to remember, mm-hmm. right? Even if it's a forced remembering, even if it's disastrous in some other ways, I do believe, I mean, I, as a human being who has experienced rock bottom many times, (laughs) there is something that comes after it that is new and um, different and has always been better Mm -hmm. for me in my life. And I am not Pollyanna about this. I mean, people are really losing. People are really hurting. People are in pain. And there's this other thing that I believe is going to happen. I think we're going to come out of this more connected and more tender and more human than we went into it. Coming up after the break, Glennon talks about how we help each other. But in the meantime, I wanted to tell you about another podcast that the editorial team here at LinkedIn has created. The show is hosted by our own editor-in-chief, Dan Roth. It's called This Is Working. Dan talks with business leaders like Mark Cuban and Rebecca Minkoff about what's working at their companies right now. The second season just dropped, and as a global pandemic turns the economy upside down and shifts every expectation we have of work, there's really never been a more urgent time to discern what it all means. 
The most recent episode features Bill Gates. So check out Dan's podcast, This Is Working, which is available wherever you get Hello Monday. Okay, back to Glennon. Glennon's been writing for into a vibrant community for more than a decade. Eight years ago, she founded a nonprofit called Together Rising. She wanted to channel all that energy into helping others, and everyone has an opportunity to get involved. Jesse, I was obsessed at the time with flash mobs. I just freaking loved the metaphor of all of these people walking around, disconnected from each other, and then one person just starts dancing like wildly and in, with joy and freedom, and then some other fool does it too. And then, then they all know the choreography and then it's this huge, joyful, collective moment, right? So my idea was to just like turn the whole world into a flash mob with this giving thing. We launched it with a model like a flash mob in that we're going to start dancing here with like joy as if we belong to each other, as if we are a community who's got each other. And then we're going to ask everybody else to start dancing by giving. But the rule is that nobody's allowed to give more than $25, right? And that was so important to me and still is because um, I just wanted this idea of giving as being something that only really rich people do or only like you can only make a difference if you're this or you're that. I just wanted that to go away and to kind of democratize the idea that like nobody's going to jump in and save us here. This is about each one of us doing our little things in our homes. And so now, I mean, I think we're I think we're up to $25 million and the average donation is still $28. Particularly in this moment when a lot of us are in our houses, we can't actually see our neighbors, let alone really help our neighbors. If we try to come through for our neighbors physically, we may be causing them danger because we could be passing mm-hmm, the virus. Right. I think we're hungry for ways to f- somehow feel like we can come together around giving. So what's yeah. Together Rising doing now? It feels like we kind of built the ark before the flood. <laughs> like We have spent the last 10 years. We've done a lot of big, huge projects, which people see about, like the reuniting families at the border and the refugee crisis and all that. That's what we get a lot of media for. But most of our time is actually spent just one at a time. People write to us and we meet the needs of women and children in their homes all over or, or without homes all over the world. So we're used to this like one first responder thing, one at a time thing. So we have the systems in place now to help people um, who are suffering, whose families are suffering because of the coronavirus. And um, those are flooding, like flooding more than ever. We need people who can to come to Together Rising and donate what they can because you know, we have an incredible system where um, we are so lucky that we have a few donors that pay our administrative costs so that every penny that's given to Together Rising by individual donors go directly to families in need. If your family needs help, come and ask for help. Like I am a person who has only survived because of the help of strangers. Like as a recovering addict, as a young mother, I have, I mean, I have never, ever been afraid to ask for help. I want people to um, kind of use this time to depend on the kindness of strangers, right? So first, I want people to turn to Together Rising if they need help. And second, if people have extra, come to Together Rising, give your extra to support those who are being brave enough to ask for help right now. Sort of a lot like what my church does in my local community, where we throw into the offering plate and where, especially recently, (laughs) the religious figures have come forward to be like, ask for it if you need it. Except, Glennon, that Mm -hmm. you're just figuring out how to do it virtually at scale. That's what I'm grateful for, that we've figured out the system already. So let's talk a little bit about the tour and and what the tour meant and what it means for the, the project itself that you can't do it. Well, it means a lot of things. I mean, the way this works is that writers, we spend years coming up with these ideas that we're so desperate to get out to people, right? And then... We write them and pour them out in drafts and drafts and drafts, and they become this book. And then this whole other part starts. I have a team of people. Mine's all women. Um, And they all have their expertise in their areas, and they plan and plan. And this group of women who were launching Untamed, I mean, they lived and breathed. They believed in this message. They believe in this message so much that they spent all of their hearts and energy planning the launch of this book. So a launch would include all the different events 
right? So we had a tour. I think we had 11 dates sold out. 18,000 people were coming to this tour. Um, I worked for six months. I have massive anxiety. So one of the ways that I control my anxiety or pretend to control my anxiety is that I like to appear on stage like I'm just talking, like I'm just thinking of things off the top of my head. Oh, that's totally how I read it when I saw you. Right. I memorize every single word that I say for 40 minutes. So, Are you kidding? No. Jesse, I every single word that I said on stage in New York is on a document that is whatever, 6,000 words long. I record it over and over again into my phone so that I can... So I love how the cadence of every single sentence sounds. So I probably record it, I don't know, 20 times. Then... I spend the next month listening to it over in sections. I listen to it so many times that it burns like neuro pathways in my mind and I can't not, and I can't forget it. This is the the process that I go through to give, not for every speech, but like my book tour speech that I'm like, okay, these people that I love are taking time out of their day, their busy, busy lives to come sit. I want to do the best possible thing that I can do for them. But I'm just telling you that this is the process I went to, to, to. This wasn't like, hey, I'll go show up on stage and say some words, right? Authors, I feel, you know, if we, pub- I publish a book once every five years, not much. That's it. Like, I can't do it faster than that because I feel like I never want to write a new book until I've become a new person. And that takes a while. Glennon, uh, let me stop you there. Um, yeah. Do you write the book over the course of five years or does the book come out in like a fever dream in a week and a half? Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? Wouldn't it be great? <laughs> no, I've, I've never had that sort of fever dream. I have heard from some authors that they do and I don't like those authors at all. It is not like that for me. It's when I'm when I'm in the process of writing a book, I'm usually getting up at about 4.30 in the morning because I, I don't know anything, anything smart after 11 a.m. Coming back to the tour, so you decide that it really can't go on. What does it mean for the business of the book? I mean, if you're launching one of these every five years, it's pretty critical to your career, right? Yeah, it's everything. You know, I mean, we were, it's kind of like if you think of it as like a singer, you know, they go away, they make their art, and then they spend however many months launching that thing into the world. And during that time, we're exposed a lot. We are on shows, we, which is never easy for a writer. It is not an easy time because most of us are introverts. Most of us start writing, so we don't have to talk to people. Right? So this idea that you have to make, you make your art and then you have to go become a commercial for your art is very strange. It's a whole separate skill that you have to learn to talk about what you've just written so it's it's the time that not only is your book being published, but you are out there reminding people that you exist in the world, which will then create opportunities, which will get you through the next five years while you write your next thing, right? Hopefully. Yeah. So in many ways, this sort of thing is, is kind of devastating to an artist's path. The tour being canceled was one thing. That wasn't the biggest thing. I mean, Amazon is not shipping. Books oh right my now. gosh. You know what? I really did not think about that. Yesterday morning, I was on the phone with my team and they were crying. Like, these are grown, badass women. This, the trauma that people are in right now and then trying to keep their jobs going. So we'll spend, you know, a week like, okay, so how can we keep getting this message out online? Right? We can keep this going online. And then we wake up and Amazon's not shipping. Like, wh- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't apparently beat a global pandemic. There is a moment where you just realize, okay, what I have known deeply for the last week is I have to stop caring about my book for a little while. Like I will, I love it so much. I believe it has a destiny. I believe it will help people. I, but right now what my community needs for me is for me to show up and just be a voice of comfort and safety and hope So that's what I'm doing. I think that everybody who is doing any sort of project in the world right now realizes that that what's happening right now, it's causing this huge shift where everything is falling away. All of our plans, 
all of that stuff. And it's just like, okay, how can we show up for each other right now? Not our product, not our whatever. Like, how can we really connect and get people through the trauma of this? What if you do the next true, the next right thing, eventually it all comes right. I believe that 100%. So yes, the entire launch of what was supposed to be my great work is screwed. But it's also in the hands of a lot of people who are at their most fearful points right now. And it's helping them. Like it's actually helping them through this time. And that to me is an, is a huge, it's huge. Yeah. You know, you said earlier about Together Rising that, that in some ways you had built the ark um, before the flood. Thank God. But in some ways you've also mm-hmm. done that with your digital presence, Glennon, mm-hmm. in that for a lot of artists, when their big concert at Carnegie Hall was canceled, um, they didn't have an automatic, easy way to connect with the people who would have been there in the mm-hmm. seats. And so showing up as a leader maybe means a different thing. But you've built that over the years. And I'm curious mm-hmm. what you're giving to that now. And more importantly, what that is giving to you right now. Well, I told Abby, or our family sat down a few days ago and said, okay, what are your goals for this time? Like, what are our intentions? What are we trying to do with this moment? in our family, in our life. And I said to them, I just want, I want to be proud of how I handled that this when I look back on it. Right. So I want to be kind to our family. I know that sounds very basic. Nope. Nope. Doesn't. (laughs) Okay. Okay. That's like, Jesse, that's like, if I can do that, my friends are calling me, they're, they're making homeschool lists. They're the things that are making Play-Doh. Like I, yeah, that's amazing. But for me, I have the astronaut food of goals when it comes to my family, right? I'm just like trying to shrink it down into the like, I will be kind. I will not be amazing in any other way. I will be gentle. I will be kind. Everyone's losing their st- their stuff. Everyone in, in families reacts to this stuff differently. So I'm trying to let everybody be human in their own way. Um, and then my other thing was I'm going to show up for my community, my Together Rising community, my online community in some way each day, right? And whether that's just like, posting a podcast that I did that I think they're going to love and bring them comfort or it's these family meetings I've been doing um, or it's something hilarious that happened in our family that I think will just like make everybody laugh for a minute. I think it's tricky. We've I've been doing that. Right. Like that has been what I've been doing for, 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 I don't know, 10 years, I guess. Like I love these people. These people have walked me through. We've grown up together. We have been showing up for each other in real life and online for 10 years. Like they have seen my recoveries. They have seen my, um, the falling apart of my marriage. They have seen my divorce. They have seen my remarrying of Abby. They have seen my children grow up. I have helped them in their times. They have helped me in mine. So it's real. Yeah. It feels like the reason I I show up, I want to show up for them is because I actually want to show up for them. What it does for me is that it just makes me feel less alone. And I have some like some benefits here because I like, for example, after I had been quarantined in my home for five days, Abby looked at me and said, you know, I've been thinking, has your life changed at all? I was like, no, no. I didn't know if anyone would notice that, but I am a writer and I'm a raging introvert and I'm a homebody. I want my dog. I want my cat, my couch. Like so I will often go five days without ever leaving my house on a regular basis. So that's coming in handy. <laughs> Great skill. I feel like all my introvert writer <laughs> friends are reporting versions of the same. If anything, the world finally <laughs> has reordered itself in a way that doesn't condemn them for their natural choices. I'm like, nice to see you all. I've lived here for years. Welcome to my wavelength. It feels like... None of the rules apply anymore. Every rule that I thought was static and unbreakable, even my most creative self could not challenge, uh, it doesn't apply anymore. So that leaves us to figure out how to listen to ourselves because that is the only way that we're going to have any order. The only order is going to come from within. And that's an uncomfortable place to be. Yeah. And it's also such an opportunity, right? I mean, I do think that's weird because the main message of the book and the main message of my life has been, okay... We have been trained to look outside of ourselves for um, expectations about how we're supposed to create the life we create and the family that we create and the relationships that we create and the companies we create and the governments we create, all of it, right? 
But I think that this part of my life is teaching me that like it didn't work for me. I did all those things right. I was a good girl and I was a good woman and I was a good Christian and I was a good wife and I was a good mother and I was freaking miserable. So um, it, it took me a while to figure out that all those goods, it's okay to want to be a good everything. You just have to define what good is for yourself, right? Because if you're defaulting to somebody else's idea of what's good, then it's always going to be a cultural idea of what's good. And for women, it is always going to be in one way or another, disappear, be quiet, get smaller, stop making us uncomfortable. However you define like the expectation, it will be one version of that. And the only way to let go of those expectations and ideals is to go within, right? Because everything, all the messages we get outside of what to do they're not pure. They're not from us. They're created by people who are trying to control us. So the only way though to do that is to get still, right? Is to start to block out all the other voices and do the the difficult but simple work of going inside and being quiet and listening for that nudge and that knowing and that voice. And here we are, right? Right? At this time when we actually might have some time to practice that. So I think that might be another way that this is like a resetting or a detoxing because we don't think about the fact that, I mean, what is it? What do they say? 87%? I think it's like 87% of every message we hear is from somebody trying to tell us, sell something to us. Yeah. It would reset our brains to actually just block off a bunch of that for a while and start like, I wonder what will come. I wonder what will bubble up for people, what new ideas people will have, what feelings will come out that have been repressed, what memories, what dreams. I think it could be like an awakening. I've been thinking so much about whether people are going to come out of this wanting to spend more time with their families, to, to, to use their time differently, to prioritize being with their families or whether we'll all fall back into very quickly. Um, all the distractions that we're more comfortable with. Yeah. Like this one moment of hope I've been thinking about is how amazing it's going to be when there's that day, whenever that day is where it's official that we can even like responsible people who have been at home are going to all go freely with freedom and joy and responsibility, be able to go out. Right. And like, soak in the sun and let our children run around and touch each other and hug and gather and dance like that is going to be so amazing. We're going to appreciate each other in ways that we maybe have never, that we've always taken for granted. And then I think because we're human beings, that will probably last about 12 minutes. (laughs) Right? I really do. Like, I don't, I don't think that it's going to last. Like, I think that we're going to go right back to like pissing each other off and not liking each other and like getting distracted. But there's no way that this experience won't change us in some profound and everlasting way, right? There will be something inside of us that we take with us because we will become something different, right? Right. There's no way we will stay the same after this, but I don't see us turning into different sorts of things. I don't think so either. That was Glennon Doyle. Her new book is Untamed, and it's out now. She's also holding regular morning meetings on Instagram. Next week, I'll bring you music producer Kabir Segal. He is holding nightly quarantine concerts with famous musicians and funneling some of the proceeds to them. And we'll talk to Broadway actress Laura Benanti. When the season's high school musicals were effectively canceled, Laura invited young performers to sing their songs for her and tag them sunshine songs. And one more thing. We'll be hosting a live show in conjunction with the amazing nonprofit Out in Tech on Tuesday, April 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern. I'll be interviewing the investor Arlen Hamilton. Arlen built and runs a VC firm that funds people of color, women, and LGBT people. She founded it while homeless. We'll hear her story live on Tuesday, April 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can follow me on LinkedIn to tune in and join in. If you like our show, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. It takes two seconds and it helps new listeners find us. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm with help from Madison Schaefer. Joe DiGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Oriendo is head of original audio and video. 
Dave Pond is our technical director. Maya Mangini, Victoria Taylor, Michaela Greer, and Juliette Perreau guide us to the next right thing. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. Thanks for listening. Stay home if you can, and I'll see you on Monday. Years ago, I started reading you, and I think it happened for most of your readers the other way, where they were Christian mothers who then got comfortable with the gay thing. It happened for me the other way, which is I was like, you read this Christian mommy blogger? Oh, my God, she's a great (laughs) writer. I totally relate to everything she writes. It was years after that that you have come into this sort of broader, I, I don't even know if you call yourself gay or not, and you don't need to, but... When you finally found Abby, I was like, well, I didn't need you to do that to speak to me. You've actually been speaking to me for like years. <laughs> but that really but got the, you. But then huh? I was like, That really yes. got you. Yeah. All right. I'm in. All right. All right I'm in. <laughs> well, I'm glad I could do that. I Thank did you. it for you. Thank you. you. Well, for Francis, yes. Yes, yes. which we appreciate. Yes, of course, for Francis.